Now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Sumit Ray, Vice President of World Procurement Dell Technologies. Uh, he, uh, thank you, sir, for joining us and welcome to our session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm Sumit. I'm an alumni of uh, Bengal Engineering College. I graduated in 1995 and right now I'm working at Dell Technologies. Uh, in the supply chain and procurement organization. So for today's session, I have a slide deck. Let me see if I can share. Okay. Are you guys able to see? Are you guys able yes. to see my screen, yeah. the PowerPoint? Yep. Yep. Yes, sir, we are able to see. The PowerPoint is up. Okay. Just trying to learn how to navigate through Microsoft Team. Okay. So as for today's agenda, you know, I'm going to walk you through what is supply chain and procurement. But before we get started into all the, with all the details, I want to set some expectations here in terms of um, what you can expect over the next 30 to 40 minutes. You know, most of you, um, I would I would say all of you are. Um, going to graduate with metallurgical engineering degree in the next one or two years. And as you go into the field, most of you would be probably in an engineering role. And even though you're in an engineering role, you are going to be working very closely with supply chain and procurement. In the current world, supply chain has evolved into a combination of uh, procurement, manufacturing, and logistics. So whether you are in the engineering function or you are in the manufacturing plants, or if you do something with logistics or procurement, you will be involved with supply chain. So as you go into the, as you graduate and you go for your job interviews, there's high likelihood that you are going to be interviewing with companies which are interested in hiring you for supply chain and procurement roles. And even if they are not looking for supply chain and procurement roles, they're going to be probably looking for engineering, but in the roles you would be expected to work with uh, supply chain and procurement. So you need to have some understanding on it. You know, I'm not sure how the course curriculum over the years have uh, evolved uh, in the college, but during my time, uh, you know, I'm a mechanical graduate. So we did study most of mechanical and we had some classes on uh, you know economics and accounting uh, but i didn't have much exposure to supply chain and procurement now in terms of uh, the current course curriculum i don't know how much exposure all of you have to supply chain and procurement uh, it might help if uh, any of you can take maybe 15 seconds to tell me if uh, there is anything in the course curriculum there way that that way i would make sure that I'm not repeating anything that you guys already know, and we can focus on something else in the presentation. So can anyone just volunteer and tell me in you know, maybe 15 seconds as to whether there is any supply chain and procurement overview that you cover in your course curriculum today? No, sir. No, okay. Okay, so I think in that case, what I would do is um, I would start with some basic introduction about supply chain and then what supply chain's role in a, in a corporate is and then what is procurement, you know, what are the different sourcing strategies at a high level and then we'll talk about how supply chain is expect to, expected to evolve uh, as we more, move more towards a digitized world uh, and also post COVID-19. Okay. And uh, all of you can ask me questions at any time if you want. And at the end also, we can have a Q&A session. So I'm pretty informal that way. I don't mind if you stop me and ask a question. You know, the, the more interactive we can make the session, the better it is. Yeah. I'll start with uh, what is supply chain, right? So supply chain is basically a set of processes which is cradle to grave 
for any product. In engineering, what you're learning is how to engineer and develop products. The entire process that an organization follows to take it from its development until its end of life, it the whole journey is called supply chain. So it starts with planning. You no, know, the plan involves an organization or a business trying to decide what the supply chain footprint will be, which means where they're going to have their manufacturing plants, where they're going to have their logistics hubs, where they're going to have their suppliers situated, what are they going to procure locally, what are they going to buy internationally. So all of that comes into the planning. The big piece of planning is what we call the network planning, which is essentially the node planning, which involves you know, linear programming and operation research to fine tune that based on your target market and your target supply base and manufacturing, what is the most optimal network? So that's part of planning. It also involves being able to plan your product's demand once you develop a product, whether it's in the technology industry or in the industrial heavy manufacturing industry, once you develop a product, what kind of demand it's going to have? That's also false under planning. Then comes the source, which is essentially procurement, where we decide what to procure, when to procure, how much to procure, who to procure from. And then we have the make, which is the manufacturing. As engineers, I would say probably many of you would go into this make section where you're going to go into the operations, either work in the product development or in the power plants or in the plants, right? Or assembly plants developing the products. And then comes the delivery, which is delivery to the customer. And finally, the returns. The return may seem to be pretty naive in terms of uh, what it does, but there's, there are some interesting aspects to it, which I'll cover in the later slides. So why is supply chain important? You know, we hear about uh, supply chain a lot, a lot from most of the Fortune 500 companies nowadays. So what's so special about it? You know, when we, st when I studied especially, I knew about operations manufacturing, but I had not heard the term supply chain at that time. You know, over the years, supply chain has gotten significant importance, and what once was just focused on operations has kind of expanded into supply chain. Operations was mainly focused on manufacturing, right? Manufacturing quality, for the most part. In, in in that bandwidth. However, now it has expanded to supply chain. You know, right now, as we look at supply chain, most of the companies are prioritizing supply chain as a strategic organization where they are hiring a very you know, critical talent is because they know that over the next one or two decades, they need to continue to invest in supply chain because supply chain has become a vehicle for innovation. In the traditional companies, you know, if you go back 20, 30 years, the way innovation used to happen was very different. The companies would have their own R&Ds. Uh, they would do innovation. They will bring a product to the market. Things have changed since then. Technology has moved along significantly. Um, you know, doing an, doing an innovation has become much more complex. And as a result, most of the organizations don't go into product innovation just by themselves. They go into innovation in collaboration with suppliers. And that's where the supply chain comes into picture whenever you work with an external partner for innovation. And it's not just about product innovation. We have to also look at you know, uh, business model innovation. Over the years, several companies has been successful by innovating on supply chain. You know, I'm from Dell, so you know, Dell is well known for being a supply chain innovator, right? We started the company as configured to order for laptops and desktops, which in those days was not thought of, right? It was mostly a retail product. So Dell came into existence with a supply chain model. Guess what? Another big company, Amazon, came into existence with supply chain model, right? Every, you know, there were brick and mortar stores. Amazon went into e-commerce, and that's how Amazon was born. If you look at... Uh, some other examples would be um, Netflix, right? How did Netflix start? Today, all of you know it as a streaming service, but it started as delivery of CDs and DVDs to customers over mail, right? So that was a new supply chain. Later on, they went into different type of innovation based on their software platform, but they started as a supply chain innovation company. 
another example would be um, or Ola or, or you know, Uber, I would say, because they were the pioneer in that industry. All they did was they just delivered, developed a platform, a supply chain platform to match demand versus supply without having a car of their own. Right. So that's Uber. So supply chain has led to a lot of innovation in the in the in the modern world. And over the next you know several decades, supply chain is going to contribute towards evolution of business models for many companies. In addition to that, supply chain also significantly contributes to the financial impact of a of a company. You know, typically people think on for a financial impact, you know, we talk about marketing, sales as to what revenues we generate. But after globalization, cost, you know, we, we call it COGS, you know, cost of goods sold and operating expense also became a critical factor of company success. Not that those were not critical before, but in a global environment, things changed because the markets opened up, the competition came from international markets, and many companies also had to venture into different markets, emerging markets. And to be able to compete in those markets, they had to focus on cost like they had never before. And supply chain is a vehicle to achieve lower cost, or I would say more optimized cost. We can also talk about customer satisfaction. Nowadays, customer satisfaction is not just based on delivering a good product quality. All of you buy you know, different things on everyday life. Uh, obviously, product quality matters, price matters, but also what matters is, you know, whether it's being customized for your need, how fast you're getting it. There are many other factors that are coming into consideration. Many of the customers buy products because they want to be green. They're socially conscious, right? And that leads to sustainability. So sustainability has become a big success factor for organizations in, in the current world. And all of that is enabled by supply chain. So now I wanted to share some more practical examples with all of you, not just um, you know, not just what the concepts are. So when we look at you know how supply chain has helped companies innovate, I give you some examples. There are some other examples like Apple. Uh, you many of you have used probably iPod. It's probably a little bit before your generation because all of you are iPhone people. But iPods for iPods when Apple came up, came out and dominated the MP3 market, which bas basically established themselves as a very strong company. iPod had a very miniaturized hard drive, which they, Apple had innovated with Toshiba. Apple actually didn't do any innovation. It basically did a collaboration with Toshiba and got into a three-year contract to lock the supply of those miniaturized hardware for three years. And as a result, once iPod was launched, none of its competition was able to get access to that miniaturized hard drive and be able to come with such a compact product. Eventually, they may move to a flash-based or a NAND memory-based storage there also they applied the same fundamentals. So basically, not only they did they did the innovation with a, with a supply chain partner, using supply chain, they actually locked out the competition for three years. And that changed Apple's future. Before that, Apple had Macintosh and was struggling as a PC company. It probably would have gone out of business if iPod was not successful. When you look at Microsoft, you know many of you probably use Xbox, many of you use PlayStation, many of you use Nintendo. All of these gaming boxes, you know, initially their innovation were all based on different games that they bring to the market. Nowadays, their innovations are based on what kind of storage they offer, how fast they do the game processing. So they are also collaborating with different supply chain partners or suppliers for driving innovation in their products. Uniqlo, Uniqlo is another example where Uniqlo developed a jeans with its suppliers uh, using some unique material, which takes significantly less amount of water to develop. Um, I don't know how many of you know, probably to, to, to make one jeans, it probably takes uh, you know more than 500,000 liters of water. So this material actually enabled them to use less water and still have the same look and feel of what of a jeans that you would buy 
from other brands. We can also talk about Samsung, which brought the industry's first you know, foldable display model. Uh, that was also an innovation that they did with their supply base. Okay. And finally, you know, Dell, I will talk about Dell, I'm from Dell. You know, Dell has also done a lot of innovation on the product side. What is interesting here, what I wanted to share is Dell has number one market share of monitor business. Many of you buy monitors uh, for your laptops or you've seen it in different places. The interesting factor is, you know, Dell competes it's with all the TV manufacturers for making monitors because the TV manufacturers have the IP, they have the big size panels, they are the natural ones to dominate the monitor industry, but they don't. How many of you really see a Samsung or a LG monitor anywhere? You see the Dell or HP or, or maybe some other brand. The reason is, you know, we have collaborated with our supply chain and fine tuned the product for usage for the for the IT industry. And it has happened through collaboration because Dell is not a company that has expertise in the panel business, LCD panel business. But we have used our supplier strength to come out with the product innovation and currently be the number one in that market. Okay. Moving into how supply chain helps with the financial goals of a company. So one of the Critical thing that it does is inventory management. The faster the inventory turns, the more profitable a company is. You know, the working capital is very important, which is linked to cash flow. Most of the successful companies are able to secure payments early and pay later. You know, when you guys, I mean, all of you use different apps or online, one of the beauty of online is that the company that's selling you the product collects your payment immediately but they don't pay their suppliers immediately. They probably pay them at a net 30. Uh, many of you may not be familiar with it, but it's just a payment term as to when they're going to pay their suppliers. They pay their suppliers 30 days later, 60 days later, in some cases, 90 days later. So that helps with the cash flow of the company. And in any business, cash is king. Right? You need to have cash flow for continuing to, to be successful. Then there is a contract and risk management. You know, As in the technology industry, the products that we develop are very high tech and there is a lot of intellectual property involved. Some of you would have read in newspapers that oftentimes there are settlements that happen before big companies. You know, just a couple of days back, there was a news on Apple paying billions of dollars to Samsung for intellectual property. So most of the companies nowadays know that intellectual property is a very critical thing to secure and protect protect uh, for competition and being successful. So supply chain is responsible to make sure that when we have contracts with our supply base or we are using somebody else's technology, we are really making sure that our risks are covered. And lastly, the supply chain also enables any organization to be successful in the public sector. You know, Public sector meaning the governments, the governments when they do purchases, whether it's the government's defense division or, or any other public undertaking, they have different set of requirements. You know, government comes out with the tenders where they say they want to give the business to a company that have X percent local manufacturing that can create so much jobs, that contributes to the local society, that has certain standards for sustainability. So supply chain organization is very critical to position an organization to win business from that sector. Yeah. Then if you look at sustainability, uh, there are some cool works that's happening in, in uh, supply chain on making sure that we are socially and environmentally responsible. You know, on Dell, you know, one of the things that you see on the top is um, our packaging material. Dell has done innovation with its supply base on using ocean plaque plastics for packaging. So we collect all the ocean waste, the plastics, and then we turn it into a packaging. You know, you see the Nike brand there. I don't know if you can recall what those are, but those are small, small rubber pieces that comes out of from shoes. So as we use the uh, shoes and we, you know, we discard the shoes once they're torn, Nike collects the shoes and using those shoes, they take out the rubber particles and, and they use that to lay artificial sports, you know, sports floors. Like for example, you know, 
for running tracks and many other uh, sport infrastructure, they use these rubbers. Starbucks, they have uh, done amazing work on sustainability. You know, they're just a coffee maker to all of us, but they have gone ahead into their supply chain and they go and see where their coffee beans are coming from and they make sure that the farmers that they grow the coffees are using the right uh, materials. They are not using child labor. They are using environmentally responsible you know, ingredients. And, and then again, Dell for, you know, Dell for our hard drives, what we do is we recycle magnets, right? Magnets come from a rare metal, a metal which is called neutonium, and the supply of that metal is pretty rare, as the name says, and it's, it's in China and some other countries where you can find that metal. So we have figured out an innovative way of recycling the magnets in the, in the hard drives. So most of the companies are getting more socially responsible, and supply chain plays a critical role in it. Now, jumping from supply chain to procurement, procurement is essentially a part of supply chain. Uh, the reason I wanted to focus on procurement is because, you know, most of you have exposure to the manufacturing side of supply chain because you're doing engineering. And then logistics portion, also most of the people have exposure to because they use logistics in day-to-day -day life. It's the procurement part, which many of you would not have exposure to. So I wanted to just deep dive into it a little bit more. So what does procurement do, right? And why is it strategic? In the technology companies, uh, procurement has become strategic because of the fact that I was talking about innovation, right? Or most of our innovation is collaborative innovation. Also, we have moved from a vertical integration to virtual integration. You know, several decades back, most companies wanted to be vertically integrated. Like if you look, think about Reliance refinery business, they always wanted to be vertically integrated. Um, Tata wanted to be vertically integrated. Most of the car companies were vertically integrated. Now with technology, most companies are moving from vertical integration to virtual integration. What does that mean? That means that they don't need to do all the integration. They can leverage their, leverage their supply base. Again, case in point, Apple. Apple is one of the biggest, biggest largest company, technology company in the whole world today in terms of market cap, probably the largest one at this point. Uh, they trade places with Amazon, but I think right now they're the largest one. But they don't have their own manufacturing. Not a single facility belongs to them. And uh, not only Apple, many of you have heard about NVIDIA, which is big in gaming. They have no factory of their own. They make you know, the graphics processing units, which is like CPUs. It's called GPUs. And they don't make their own. It's just design. They have no fabs. So. Most of the companies are nowadays successful through virtual integration. So procurement has become a very critical success factor for them. Also, as technology is evolving, most of the things are becoming more and more commoditized, which is where procurement plays a big role. And at the same time, product life cycles are getting short. You know, many, many decades back, a product lasted much longer. Nowadays, in the technology industry especially, products life cycle has become very short. It's probably a year and a year and a half, you guys change cell phones, you guys change PCs, you can change every, every gadget that you have. So you need a very strong procurement organization to keep pace with that, manage the suppliers, uh, do the right negotiation, do the right contract work, and ensure that there is supply as we go through this short product life cycles. So this is a little bit of details on it. I'll probably not go too much de into details on it. Uh, the middle section, you see a graph. It's basically a product life cycle. Many of you, as I was saying, are going to go into product development. Any product goes through these several phases, right? From development to uh, introduction or launch to growth, maturity, and then final decline. And every company has several of these product life cycles that they go through. So here, what I've tried to do is I've mapped procurement with each phase of the product life cycle as to how procurement is involved. So if you go into product development, uh, product engineering, or if you go to supply chain, you will come across all of these activities, right? which includes uh, working on new technology with engineering, uh, to developing IPs with the suppliers, to making sure that if we are developing a new technology, we secure the, the exclusivity rights. right? So it is procurement's job to go and make sure that if I am innovating with a supply with a supply chain partner i have exclusive rights to it because my partner would want to go and sell the technology to somebody else also to to develop scale 
So I must secure first to market and exclusivity rights like Apple did in, my, in the example that I provided. Then we go into the growth phase. In the growth phase, we have to know how the product's growth is going to be. It's anybody's guess whether the product's product is going to be successful or not so much successful. We have to anticipate that. And then we have to make sure that we are negotiating the right cost so that the product can be successful and at the same time support the product's demand and supply. And then finally, as it goes to decline, we want to make sure that we are not stuck with a lot of obsolescence. We are optimizing our inventories and at the same time negotiating costs so that we can gradually get out of the product and move to the next one. You know, that brings me to the next thing, which is sourcing strategy, right? What the sourcing strategy does It basically says any company has to decide what they're going to buy and how. Procurement or supply chain doesn't mean that we have to buy everything, right? We have to use our judgment as to what we should buy. Any component that contributes to our core competency or helps with our competitive advantage, we got to be buying, right? For example, you know, you have heard about 3M. Uh, what is 3M's core competencies? 3M's core competency is in in the adhesive that they make, right? That's their, that's their core competency. They have variety of products from industrial products to consumer products, but one thing that's common is it's all to do with adhesives. So when they procure adhesives, they want it to be their strategic component. Similarly for Dell, when we do laptops, we have certain commodities that we want to manage ourselves, but then there are certain things which we don't need to manage because we also have contract manufacturers who are developing or, or who are assembling products for us they can procure those on behalf of us so we can outsource it. And in some cases, outsourcing makes sense because let's say we use a contract manufacturer for laptop manufacturing or sub-assemblies. Who is doing the laptop manufacturing for Dell? At the same time, they could be doing for HP, they could be doing for Lenovo. So they can actually build a much bigger scale than what I can in procurement in Dell because they can combine the volumes across all the IT industry and then go and source certain things. And I can let them do it because they're going to get a better cost and probably they're going to manage the supply chain with much more flexibility. But if they are commodities based on which I differentiate myself from HP, I'm not going to give it to anybody. So that's the in-house part. And then there is a mixed model where there could be some uh, some components which I may get involved to some extent for it. For example, there could be some components which are not competitive advantage, but I know that we run into, let's say a lot of quality issues on those components. If that's the case, you know, I want my engineering organization to identify which suppliers we should procure from for, for better quality. So I'm going to probably get involved into deciding which suppliers we buy from, but I don't need to manage the entire supply chain. Right. So those are some of the sourcing decisions we make um, on the procurement side. This is another example of uh, you know how we source based on what the buyer power and the supplier power is. You know, there's a there's a model in uh, supply chain called Porter's model, which basically looks at the buyer power and the supplier power and decides what to build. So when you look at our IT industry. When I have to do procurement, I have to do procurement of processors and the operating system very differently from the way I procure, let's say, a memory or a hard drive or a panel. And the reason for that is Intel and Microsoft are monopoly, or best duopoly. So the supply is dominated, right? I cannot go and negotiate anything with them. I cannot do anything different with them. The, you know, for Intel or Microsoft, it doesn't matter whether Dell is buying the product or HP is buying the product. And you're going to come across these kind of situations as you go into your work environment. You will find many such cases where the suppliers are dominating because of the IPs that they have. In such cases, the approach is more building partnership. You know, with Intel, what the partnership I want to build is how do we grow and increase PC penetration in India? PC in India, we sell only 10 million, but the population is you know, 1.4 billion. So how do we go and increase PC penetration in India? That is something that Intel will be interested in because they want to go PC penetration. They don't care about Dell or, in, or HP. So my strategy has to be focused towards that. Similarly, if it's buyer dominant, which is the lower quadrant of this chart, it means the buyer has the dominance because it's parts which could be a metal part uh, which can be done by simple forging, stamping, 
there's no ip involved there's not you know there's nothing involved anybody can build that for me so as a company i am going to invest in the development of tooling uh, investment of capacity at the supplier i'm going to bear all of that because they're going to do what i want them to do and then there is the interdependent which actually creates competitive advantage which means that commodities which are market driven where there is market demand and supply that comes into picture for example uh, memory or hard drives where as an it industry i'm competing with the smartphone industry because they also need storage they also need memory i'm also competing with amazon and microsoft because they are cloud they are buying for their products i'm also competing with automotive because as as companies like tesla move towards automated automated uh, driving and autonomous driving they need a lot of processing power in the car the car is a computer essentially which is which will have lots of data about the maps with all the sensor sensors collecting data they're going to store it locally and then send it to the servers so they are also buying these i'm also buying these so there is a market dynamics there and that is where we can create competitive advantage if as a dell employee if i can figure out how to outsmart hp and secure the strategic supply at a better cost then i create a differentiation i cannot create a differentiation based on buyer dominated commodity or a supply dominated commodity there the level the level playing field is the same it's only the interdependent ones where we can create competitive advantage right. so from there i wanted to you know jump into the area where we can create competitive advantage which is market driven how do we manage market demand and supply you know many of you may have studied this in your econ class economics class you know you've seen this price elasticity curve it talks about demand and supply and basically there are sub, there is a surplus market there is a shortage market and as market commodity professionals the procurement has to ensure that in a shortage market they are buying ahead they are hedging and in a surplus market they are playing a reverse strategy it's just like uh, think about how airline industry has done with oil you know when the oil prices started going up you know 10 12 years back southwest came out on top of other airlines because they had a very strong hedging strategy where they bought all at oil at 50 60 dollars and when the market went to 100 dollars their competition was buying at 100 dollars whereas they had inventory sitting at 50 60 dollars and that gave them a huge competitive advantage so the concepts that you have learned in your class with the econ in the econ class are going to come to use in supply chain uh, at the same time there's game theory right when we are working with our suppliers and also looking at and trying to guess the market and trying to assess what our competition is doing we have to keep in mind what is the game theory here you know what is HP going to do or what is the Lenovo going to do what is my competition going to do what is my supplier going to do because nowadays suppliers can be competition as well right Microsoft is my supplier as an OS supplier but they are my competition in the cloud we don't have public cloud but we have hybrid cloud so many of the suppliers eventually become competition so we have to know what the game theory is going to be as we deal with them so that's all I had about procurement. Uh, I want to feel the, spend the last, you know, five minutes talking about where supply chain is going. Right. So we talked about how supply chain was with, you know, vertical integration, and then, uh, you know, with the globalization in probably 1995, 2000 time frame, uh, the whole supply chain changed because everybody had access to different markets and they had access to suppliers in different countries, and that is a result of that many of the manufacturing moved to the asia side uh, the countries such as korea china thailand to some extent india benefited from those moves right taiwan was also another example which benefited from that move so as that happened the supply chain became globally spread out before that supply chain was local you know if you Think about how Ford Motor or General Motors used to, de used to develop automotives. The Detroit was the hub. So they would get all their suppliers to set up plants and their ecosystem in Detroit area. And that's how the supply chain worked. But with globalization, the whole dynamics changed. As we went to 2010s, the supply chain evolved again because of segmentation. And what segmentation means is, you know, the products got more and more customized. 
somebody wanted the product in a different form and fashion, for example, we saw phones coming out with different colors, right? Somebody wanted the same phone with a red color. You know, somebody wanted it with blue color. You know, jeans started coming up with not just blue and black, but different shades of jeans. So as a result of that, companies had to go and segment their supply chain and decide how they're going to support these evolving business needs. So that was the time where mass customization happened. And it's still happening. Mass customization is still happening. Once we go into the next decade, there are going to be some major changes that happen in supply chain. One is because of COVID. You know, COVID has given us some very critical learnings on how supply chain should be. Uh, most of the company's supply chains have been tested during this time, the resiliency of it, the agility of it. And then there's geopolitical risks. You know, If I might say, uh, from globalization, we are probably moving into more nationalization. Many of the countries are very national focused now. Um, it has happened in the US, which was completely a free open market. It's still open market, but things have started to change. China has, has changed over the last, I would say, 10 years, five to 10 years, uh, where they want to have a prominence in the entire global supply chain. And they have started to do that with their projects on the China-Pakistan corridor. They are, they are trying to take uh, a lot of control on the supply chain. They are going into the South China Sea because they want to dominate the supply chains, right? That flows through those regions. In addition, you know, if you look at many other countries, there's a flavor of nationalism. In India, also there is a little bit of it. Uh, if you go to Philippines, there is a little bit of it. You go to Brazil, there is a little bit of it. So because of that, the supply chains are going to change because we'll probably not have a pure globalization working anymore. The supply chains have to be fragmented because a U.S. company would probably, U.S. government will come back and say to the U.S. companies that the China purchases have to be restricted. China would probably do something similar. So we have to factor those in. And unless supply chain organizations think about that, the company is going to struggle when these changes come in. And lastly, digitization. There's a big changes happening on digitization with artificial intelligence coming in, machine learning coming in. So the business models are changing and supply chain has to change. So this is just an example of what you know the worldwide leaders of Fortune 500 companies have done when they were faced with COVID, uh, except one, which is the privacy expectation. Rest of all deal with supply chain. So the CEOs, the CFOs, and the other C-leaders have all focused on how do they make their supply chain more agile and resilient as they go through COVID. And that's going to bring some major changes into the marketplace. In addition to COVID, you know, which hopefully is temporary, the other thing that's happening is there is a lot of disruptive technologies coming in. You know, mainly through you know mass customization. Uh, you know, there's like I was saying, AI, ML, manufacturing will change because of AI, ML. You know, distribution warehousing will change over a period of time because autonomous vehicles are coming, drones are coming. So a lot of changes are coming. At the same time, our customer behavior is changing. Customer expects speed. They expect visibility. Nowadays, we just don't order something and we are happy when it shows up. We want to see where it is, and most of the companies show you through their supply chain where it is right now. And then we want customized products. And many of us care about the, about the climate, about the world, so we want to buy products which are green. So because of this, all of the supply chain is going to change. So I want to finish with what are good things that we're going to change, we're going to see change, mostly in digitization and risk management, because the geopolitical dynamics that are happening, the COVID that is happening, uh, the sustainability work that's happening because many companies or many customers and countries are saying, we want to reduce carbon footprint. You know, we want renewable energies. All of those have to be factored into the supply chain. So that's one area. And the digitization is going to drive how we use data. How do we use statistical analysis? How do we use you know, artificial in intelligence in our supply chain, in the warehouses, can the warehouses be automat automated where drones and autonomous vehicles are moving materials on their own using artificial in intelligence and machine learning. So all of these are going to come in supply chain. So supply chain is going to be a very interesting area for the next 10 years, um, the way I say it. With that, you know, I want to finish uh, my talk here. And the thought that I want to leave all of you with is, you know, as you go into your job interviews or your 
uh, as you transition into your career from college, you need to understand, you need to have a very good understanding of the supply chain because you're going to come across it some way or other, directly or indirectly. Uh, many of you would probably have careers in supply chain. Many of you may not, but it's good to know what's happening in supply chain. And with the things that are happening in supply chain, supply chain will be a growing area over the next 10 to 20 years. There'll be a lot of job opportunities in that area. A lot of so with that, uh, let me pause here and open it up for uh, any Q&A. Thank you, sir, for your insightful presentation on supply chain. Now, a few questions from our curious attendees. Uh, over to Ritam. Hello, sir. We have a few Hello. questions for you. Like the first question is, if you are looking for a career in the supply chain management, then what are the main skills required? You know, for supply chain career, the main skill sets that I would say is required is, you know, the tech, the tech, you are getting a lot of technology knowledge as part of your course curriculum. Uh, you need to develop your business acumen and learn the fundamentals of supply chain and procurement. I don't think any company that is going to hire undergraduates expects a lot in terms of you having supply chain and procurement knowledge. What typically we look for in a candidate is that they are analytically strong. They have a business acumen. Because, you know, knowing technology is one thing, but in the end, when you come to supply chain and procurement, you are basically combining the technical skills with the business skills. So we want people who have the business acumen, uh, understand the overall business priorities. So in terms of skill sets, I would say you should know about, you know, some fundamentals of uh, you know, the, how, how a corporate works, you know, how, what, for example, what are the basic financials of a company, right? What does a balance sheet means? What's a profit and income statement means? What does COGS means? What does OPEX mean? What does cost mean? Uh, and some of it you probably would have already studied, you know, what is cost accounting? You need to know a little bit of that. And at the same time, you need to know a little bit about the supply chain fundamentals. Some of the fundamentals that I covered, you probably have to spend a little bit of time going through it Again, just to have awareness and know the key terminologies and the keywords, I would say that is what is going to be expected. Other than that, you know, when we are hiring undergrads, we always expect to develop the talent. We don't expect them to necessarily bring a lot of knowledge. We expect them to come in and have critical thinking, problem solving skills, and uh, analytical skills. And as long as you have that, it's not a challenge to get into supply chain. I myself made the transition. You know, I, when I was in uh, Bengal Engineering College, I didn't know anything about supply chain. I went into IT industry, um, completely different line, right? IT services, um, delivery, and then I changed into supply chain. It's actually, it actually it was not that difficult of a transition. Getting in is sometimes very difficult, but once I got in, it's just the skill sets I had about problem solving, uh, critical thinking, analytical skills. That's what has contributed to my success. And I firmly believe that when I hire or when I, any of my peers hire at Dell, they apply the same criteria. Thank you, sir. We have another question like, how can we apply supply chain management in a small scale startup? In a, in a small scale startup, you need to have innovation. Right? So the innovation could be a product innovation or you have to have a supply chain innovation. Especially if you are innovating something which is based on a technology platform, like nowadays a lot of people are developing um, and doing entrepreneurship using the various apps. In, in other words, that's basically a type of supply chain. Using the app, you are basically connecting the buyer and the seller and, and creating market demand and supply. So that's kind of supply chain innovation. 
whenever you start an organization other than the product, I would say you need to understand the supply chain basics because in the longer run, the success of your venture would depend on the success of your supply chain as well, not just the product. It's very rare that somebody makes a product that's really and truly unique and first. Many of you have heard the company name Xerox. You know, at one point of time, we knew Xerox. Uh, Xerox was a synonym for copying. Actually, Xerox is a company very well known for its innovation. But where Xerox has struggled over the over a period of time is in commercializing their products through a very strong supply chain. As an example, you know, all of you use mouse. Mouse was first created by Xerox, and they didn't do they they were not in PCs. You know, nowadays you hear about foldable displays, right? You have you have curved monitors, curved display. You have cell phones that open and close with the folded displays, panels. Again, Xerox was the first one to do it. Essentially, where I'm going with this is the product certainly matters. It's the core. But with that, unless you have a very strong supply chain to support it, success becomes very difficult. So as you go into a new small venture, you have to figure out how you can manage your supply chain as the lowest cost and you can have reliable partners, right? That's where you have to spend time. And if you are going into a venture, entrepreneurship venture, and you are the ones who are who is bringing in the product idea, my recommendation is that you probably partner with somebody who has some supply chain experience because as an entrepreneur, you probably cannot do everything. You can focus on only certain things, right? So if your focus is building a product, then you need somebody who can look at the supply chain side. So I would say get help and certainly focus on supply chain. Many people underestimate that, and that becomes the differentiator be become between success and failure. And not only that, you know, if you go you if you go into your own entrepreneurship, eventually you are going to raise capital, you are going to get some help from a venture capital, or somebody is going to put money into it. And if somebody is going to put money into it, you have to show them a business plan, and you have to show them a return on investment. Unless you understand supply chain, you cannot do it. Obviously, you can make a model on how your product will sell, or how much the market would be. You need to do that part of the business planning. But you also need to show the cost, how we are going to scale up the company, from a supply chain perspective, because that will show the venture capitalist how you are planning to scale in the longer run. Because if the business can't scale, they are not going to be interested. So I would say, ask for help, get somebody's help who is who has some knowledge in supply chain management, but suddenly do not ignore it. It's going to be a critical factor. Okay, sir, we have a last question for you. That is, what is the opportunity of a metallurgy graduate in Dell? So in Dell, you know, we hire undergraduates and we take engineering graduates because one of the ways for us to ensure that we pick the right talent is to take engineering graduates, right? Is engineering really required in supply chain? To some extent, yes, some extent, no. You know, when I was talking about procurement and I was talking about innovation. So in our groups, we have people who are, you know, technical experts. In my, in my group, I have few people who are pure technical experts who have come from technology background who know almost equal to what an engineering department person knows. And the reason is we want to bridge between technology and the business side. The engineering department looks at the product. They're not looking at the business side and we are looking at the business side, but we need somebody to be in the between who can translate between the two. So we certainly prefer people with technology background and we prefer people with engineering skills because in the end, engineering brings a structured thinking. That's my belief, right? Once we go through the engineering courses, we see things as process, we develop analytical skills. You know, some engineers are creative, many are not. But in the end, what engineering school does is puts them into a structure. And as you go into supply chain, what we need is the structured thinking. 
the creative thinking is important, but but that's a different part of it. The first thing is the structured and analytical thinking, and engineering graduates do bring that. Now, in terms of what metallurgy does, I would say certainly a metallurgy graduate would have a huge prospect in an industry which is depending on metallurgical products however you know which is more metal based and heavy industries but regardless of that I, I you know when we hire at dell we don't look at necessarily metallurgy engineering or me mechanical engineering or computer science or electronics we just take, we just consider everybody as the same because in the, in the end the skill set that you're going to bring internally is not your metallurgical knowledge obviously if my products are such that there may be metallurgy knowledge required. For example, within Dell, if somebody somebody with metallurgy background came into supply chain, I'm going to probably go and put them into my, in, you know, what we call structural commodities. Right? Structural commodities are where we work with our suppliers for building the metal chassis and <clears throat> doing a lot of innovation work on how the laptop's finish will be, how the chassis of the big servers and the storage boxes will we make would look like and what kind of materials would those be. So there, a lot of knowledge of metallurgy would be helpful. So I'm going to certainly put them there, but that doesn't stop anybody from coming in. You know, at the, at the end, in the end, it's not that in our structural procurement team, we have all metallurgical engineers. We have just engineers. I would say, for supply chain uh, roles at Dell, as long as you're an engineering graduate and you are willing to go and learn more about the business and you are not you know, uh, confining yourself to purely engineering related roles, you're most welcome. And with your background and which is, you know, you guys, you guys are going, you know, studying at BE college, you know, which is well known in the industry. We talent that comes into B college, gets out of B college, and most of the industry respects that. So you're going to get hired basically because of your um, analytical skills for the most part and problem solving skills. And the engineering, engineering is just handy, is nice to have. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your time and sharing with us the exciting forays of supply chain. Uh, Team Reminiscence wishes you a very good day. Thank you, sir, for joining. Thank you, and best of luck to all of you. I wish you all a very bright future. And if you have any questions, you. You know, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, Bye.